Hello, everyone. Um, before I start, I just want to say thanks to the people who deserve thanks. Um, you know who you are, and the rest of you who will know who they are very shortly as well. So my name is Kate O'Donnell, and tonight I am going to tell you a tale of spite, murder, revenge, justice, and dogs, because dogs. Dogs. Dogs! Oh, there's going to be so much of that. Okay. So there are a few details of the story that have been sort of telephoned throughout the centuries. So as the most likely to be historically accurate version of the story goes, we are in France in 1371 in the court of King Charles V of France. And among the men of his court is the Chevalier or Knight Maquet, shown here in this foreshadowing statue. <laughs> now, Maquet was a bit of a rancorous fellow, um, which is really just a nice way of saying that he was probably an asshole. <laughs> and Maquet harbored a deep grudge against fellow man of court Aubry de Montdidier. The king favored Montdidier over Maquet, probably Maquet, because he was a bit of an asshole. And there are many depictions of the end of the story, but as you can see from these fine portraits right here, we have sort of a dearth of images of the story itself. And so may I present, for your visual pleasure, a historically inaccurate historical reenactment. <laughs> The Chevalier Marquet and Aubry de Montdidier. Now one day, now you see why I was thinking people. Okay, one day, Marquet came upon Montdidier when Montdidier was in the forest of Bondy in France walking his dog. Marquet joined him <laughs> for a splendid stroll, which quickly became less splendid, likely because Marquet was probably an asshole. So much so, in fact, that Maquet murdered Montdidier. <laughs> Viciously, we may presume, because Maquet was probably an asshole. And then Maquet dumped Montdidier in a shallow grave. This is miming, being in a shallow grave. Likely congratulated himself on a perfect witnessless crime and returned to court. But he forgot about the dog. <laughs> dog. Now, Montdidier had a large greyhound. This is miming, being a large greyhound. And the name of this magnificent beast has unfortunately been lost to history. So it is known popularly as Le Chien de Montargis, literally the dog of, from Montargis. Now, also, I just want to say, history records this dog as being male. But as you will tell from the rest of the story, I think it's pretty clear that she was female. Le Chien de Montargis. Now, for Le Chien, Montdidier was her sun and stars. And so despite his cruel death, she would not leave his side because dogs. <laughs> and so there in the forest, Le Chien de Montargis remained, not leaving even to eat because dogs, until she could stand it no longer and return to town to beg because dogs. Now, Le Chien went to the home of Montdidier's BFF, and the friend fed her, and then she returned to the forest to the site of Montdidier's shallow grave. Now, this continued. She would go to town, beg, be fed, go back to the forest, and finally, Montdidier's friend took the Jesus H. Christ, Timmy is in the well hint <laughs> and followed her. She followed her into the forest, to Montdidier's shallow grave, again, miming being in a shallow grave. Now, Le Chien pawed at the freshly dug earth. Montdidier's murdered body was exhumed, and all began to speculate about who had done this darkest of deeds. Now, Le Chien was a gentle soul, friendly to all, aggressive to none, but one day, walking in the village, she saw Maquet. Murderer. <laughs> Murderer of her sun and stars and attacked him with great violence. 
And this repeated day after day. She was the picture of docile kindness until she saw that asshole and got really aggro and it tried to attack him because dogs. <laughs> now in short time, all the town suspected. Lucia had obviously witnessed the murder since she knew where the body was. And you know, Lucia knew Maquet was the culprit. Now, King Charles V heard tell of this peculiar behavior and so summoned Le Chien to court. <laughs> he ordered that a large group of men of court gather, gather before him, and then he placed Maquet in that group of men in the middle of the crowd, then released Le Chien to see what would happen. As usual, she went directly for Maquet, and that was enough for the king. He ordered that Maquet be tried for murder in trial by combat, also known as the judgment of God, in which the accuser duels the accused and whomever God sees fit to win is clearly in the right. There was just one thing. Maquet's accuser was Le Chien. And so for his murder trial, Maquet would have to duel the dog. Now, this is where we actually do have a number of historic depictions, these lovely engravings, this other lovely engraving, this one, this one. And as you can see, they did indeed duel on the island of Notre Dame. Now, it may not have been exactly fair. There may have been some preferences given. They gave Lucia a nice barrel to hide in. Uh, and they gave Maquet some rather impractical weapons. Um, it was either a cudgel or a lance neither of which might be your ideal weapon when dueling dogs. And these painstaking engravings are far more beautiful than the artistry of mine that we were just seeing, but we're gonna return to that because mimes. <laughs> now, the duel began and as you can see, it was a vicious fight. <laughs> Every time Maquet would lunge for Le Chien, she would back away and she circled and circled, biding her time as Maquet got more and more tired until she saw her moment. Wait, this is an important picture. She saw her moment and went in and attacked. <laughs> now Le Chien's teeth were about Maquet's throat and so Realizing that he had lost, he cried for mercy and declared he would confess. And so it was that Le Chien de Montargis avenged the murder of her son and stars because dogs. And Chevalier Maquet was hanged and justice was done. Now since then, this story has been recorded in multiple French history texts hashtag thank you, Google Translate, uh, by famous nonfiction essayists, Benedictine monks. It has also been dramatized uh, into a highly popular play, a less highly popular short film, uh, a children's book, and even a comic book. Um, this one is my particular favorite. The story was used in Italy to market Vero Estrato di Carne, which if you don't know what that means, I didn't either. Before I tell you, I would like to remind you that this is a story of a man versus a dog being used to market this product. It is real meat extract. <laughs> Hashtag bullion advertising pitches I really wish I could have seen. <laughs> now, the story is also a point of civic pride for the French town of Montargis. There are statues, stained glass windows, and even a store where you can buy chocolate, Crotte du Chien de Montargis, literally the poop from the dog from Montargis. <laughs> now I would like to pause for a minute and take a quick Odslan poll. This is not a trick question. If you think that this A totally happened, maybe some details are off, but it, one way or another this occurred, please shout at me right now. I love the believers, it's so good. Okay, um, if you think it was a total crock of Croc de Chien de Montargis, yell at me now. Wow, um, I thought that this was going to be a slide talking about how I was shocked and then I'd be like, oh, I'm not shocked. I actually am shocked, I'm really excited that so many of you 
are believers, but really the answer just depends on who you ask. Over the centuries, a number of people have spent years of their lives studying this, not the story, whether or not the story is true. Historians, even a local government committee in Montargis was tasked with determining the veracity of this story. And essentially, if you will, there's been a duel between those seeking the answer. Some people are really determined to prove that it's true, and others are really determined to prove that it's false. There are those who have meticulously plotted the timeline of any possible origin of the story, which I will quickly, in hopefully one minute or less, summarize thusly. So, in the late 1800s, the play goes up, the historians say, oh, I wonder if this is true, and they do a genealogy of this story, then people do it again in the early 1900s, and then they do it again in aforementioned Montargis government committee. They find that there was a record in the late 1300s that said the story was so popular that it was painted everywhere in France, and then they look for the origin of the 1371 date, find that a monk added it to an engraving in the mid 1600s, then they find that uh, other things, what are they finding now? Oh, <laughs> there's a similar story that they've recounted. This is really small. And uh, then there's something else about a 1414 duel afterwards, which wouldn't make any sense if everyone knew the story beforehand. And then um, maybe there's a poem in there somewhere that talked about this. Then they also find an account in the 1500s of someone talking about a painting that's multiple hundreds of years old in a castle in Montargis that has Charlemagne in it, which obviously doesn't fit anywhere on this timeline, but the painting no longer exists, and it is unclear why the person who described this thought that it was Charlemagne. Basically, what sealed it was a report in the 1600s that Renaissance essayist Michel de Montaigne had handwritten a note in one of the volumes of his works on a chapter that's talking about dogs and justice and people. He handwrote this anecdote into it. And so they did the analysis of his handwriting. It was determined to, this was true. He was this great famous nonfiction person. Clearly, this meant that this was true. But then a hater in the 1970s decided to go back and look at all the things and figure out why there were so many discrepancies. And they called the private library where supposedly this handwritten book existed. And the handwritten book was too precious to be able to be photocopied or scanned. And the historian clearly did not have funding to go to Bordeaux to find out for themselves. But the librarian says it's not there if that's the same book. Anyway, you decide. Basically, what it comes down to is that either someone made up an awesome story and it spread like wildfire, and then 300 years later, an author played a prank by saying he'd found evidence that the story was real, both of which were wild successes, as people have either been telling or devoting their lives to debunking this story for over 600 years. Or, in one form or another, this happened because dogs. <laughs> right? And any confusion over details are just the natural consequences of ill-documented history. Really, either way is a win. And the thing that determines which side of this truthiness you believe in is really the same thing that determines whether or not you think a trial by combat has been won justly, or really any trial, um, which, is that, which is that the side that you take is determined by the personal experiences and assumptions that you came into the whole thing with from the very beginning. Anyone who's met my dogs knows which side I think is true. They would totally do this because dogs, and so based on my very scientific, personal, anecdotal evidence that has emotional triggers for me and so rings very true, <laughs> science, <laughs> I find it most likely that something like this would have occurred in history. Thank you. Right? Because dogs. And so I would like to make a toast to remembering our bias, no matter what side of the duel we are on, and to dogs, because dogs. <laughs>